All right, good morning, Faith Chapel. Good to be here, good to see you here. Uh, yes, I'm feeling my age, so turn with me to Revelation chapter one, and we'll start there with a verse <clears throat> talking about conditions in our society. Uh, yeah, we'll do a communion at the end. Uh, <clears throat> talking about conditions at, of our society. We could talk about that. We could make that the point of our messages. We could talk about the social conditions in the world. We could talk about the evil our government is imposing upon Christians, the injustices. Um, perhaps we should someday, but I prefer to direct your attention to God's word. That's all I know, and I don't know enough of that. And since we've been studying in Revelation, and the sub-theme is looking for a city, I want to direct your attention to that today. Now, the verse I want you to look at is Revelation chapter 1. And we look at Revelation, and as I go around to nursing homes, I ask the senior citizens if they've studied or read the book of Revelation. Very few have read it or studied it. And that's a shame, because we look at it wrongly. We look at it as a thing that it's terrible judgments. We don't understand the symbols. We don't understand these awful things that happen to the earth. But what we must first understand to understand anything in Revelation is this first verse. And that is actually the first words. The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of who he is and what he will do to those who refuse to bow the knee to Christ. That's Revelation. It's not about, not as much about what he's going to do as about who he is and what he will do. Okay? And that's why I talked about the city. It's all about the city. Uh, today we're going to talk about singing in the city. Uh, talk about, we could talk about music, the theory of music, what music does to the human body. Music is good for the soul and all the logic of singing, and there's a whole big subject out there available. But uh, in the Bible, you can go from the beginning of singing mentioned from Exodus 15 to clear at the end of Revelation and talk about singing. Joshua sang, Miriam sang, uh, the judges are singing in each of the books of the Bible. But uh, our theme, we talked about Abraham looking for a city. Now, it doesn't mention anything that Abraham sang. But the point is that he looked for a city. And that's in Hebrews 11.10. He lived as an alien. He lived as a stranger in the land of promise, but he looked while he lived. And he's an example of you and I living by faith because he was called out of a pagan situation. He was a pagan himself, and he believed God's word. Abraham lived way before the cross of Christ, Yet he lived by faith on the same words that you and I have. We live after the cross and we look back, as he looked forward, we look back and we still live by faith on the same words of God. We have them printed. Abraham didn't have them printed. He heard them verbally. So you and I have the same faith. We have the same cross. And we live in the same pagan world. Nothing has changed. Hebrews 13, 22 says, For here we do not have a lasting city. We don't belong here. We don't belong here. We're looking for the city which is to come. Just mention these verses. Hebrews 12, 22 mentions Mount Zion, the new city, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, only to those who are enrolled in the new city. Hebrews eleven sixteen, 16, he has prepared a city for these people who walked by faith. And John 14, Jesus told the 12 disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. So the city is only for those who are enrolled, whose names are in the book of life, only those whose believers who are believers in the Lord Jesus. Now, last Sunday was Memorial Day. And we have it once a year, on, in the U.S., we remember those who've sacrificed their lives for our freedom that you and I enjoy this very minute. We, we sing the songs of patriotism, my country tis of these. We salute the flag, we hold the flag up, we have marches, we play taps, we cry, we hear the bands, and we, we 
feel the fervor of our great country and from the freedom of the tyranny that we've, we've left. But the religious freedom and the political freedom, which, by the way, as Jeff mentioned, is coming back. It's coming back. So that's Memorial Day in our country. But for the believer, every Sunday should be Memorial Day to remember the one who gave his life for us, the one person, not the many soldiers and many men and women. We honor them, but every Sunday is Memorial Day to remember the one who sacrificed himself. We'll do that in a few minutes. We sing in songs. We sing songs of the one who gave his life for us. We're enjoined to praise him, to honor him. And it shouldn't just be once a year, not even once a month. It should be every day. But collectively, we get together we remember the one who gave his life for us from the tyranny of sin, from Satan's tyranny, from the mockery. Now, we don't think much of those who don't honor our country. We call them terrorists or rebels. We don't like them. They find no need to honor our country. In fact, they seek to destroy it. Why then should we honor those who's, who have no time to honor Christ by coming together collectively? It's the same thing. Um, by not attending a collective worship service is dishonoring to Christ. It does not glorify him. It's not worship by not coming together, as we'll see. Um, so, how, how, why do I make those dogmatic statements? Because in heaven, in heaven, all singing, saying, praise will be to one person to God alone. In heaven, we will worship. In heaven, we will honor. In heaven, we'll praise him. Who? God the Almighty, the Creator, the Lamb, the slain Lamb. So our subject today is singing in heaven, saying, praising God. As I said, the word doxology is the word from doxa, which means praise or glory, and the word logic put together, which means words or saying, and that's saying words to God. So in heaven, Here's something else. I'm going to make a dogmatic statement. In heaven, no one worships alone. No one worships alone. No one. Because every record of people singing and standing before the throne is always with a large number of people. I can worship God in the woods. I can worship God anywhere. And yes, you can. But God has called us to come together to worship, because in heaven, you'll be with millions of other people. It's always in the company of redeemed people, always. What do redeemed people sing? Of redemption, of redemption. Our worship services should always be a piece of heaven. So for today, there are 14 different instances, 14 verses I want to direct your attention to, where people sang or said, and they worshiped God. So the important thing is who's singing and the content of their words. It's always, always about God. It's always about the Lamb. So why would it be anything else? Why would we sing about heartbreak when in heaven there will be no heartbreak? Why would we sing about all the situations of earth? In, he in heaven there will be no situations of earth. The only song we're going to sing in heaven is about Christ. So, and what he's done for us. And that's the only reason you're there. Remember the pearly gates? Every time you go in and out of the city, you'll see those gates of pearl, and they'll remind you of the suffering of Christ. So, 14 times in Revelation, and I want to take your direction, take you to them, we can see what they said and who was saying them. So, follow along with me. Turn, first of all, to Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. Eight, to the very first one, there's 14. I want to take your attention. We'll talk a little bit about each one. Again, not about the theory of music, the logic of music. It's beautiful how there are seven notes, and each, each note is mathematically placed. They mean important, they're important. Just singing who sang and the content of the song in Revelation only. Revelation 4 8. First of all, who's singing? Verse 8. The four living creatures are the ones that are singing here. Who are the four living creatures? They're specially chosen angels. Satan was one of those cherubim. 
He was the anointed chariot. Then he left. He got kicked out. So there's four here around the throne, and it gives them descriptions, and they cease not night and day to say this phrase. So in heaven, all eternity day, you will hear this phrase, whether directly, indirectly, in the background, as an echo, you'll hear these words. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. They don't stop singing it, these four angels. So always in the background. You know, you get on an elevator, you go to the hospital, you have music. You go to the store, you have music. Crazy stuff, I have to admit. But in heaven, the elevator music will be holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's what you'll hear always because it says they cease not to say. What does it mean? It means what it says. Holy, holy, holy. It's, it's a reference to Isaiah 6, and I challenge you to look at that. Isaiah 6, when Isaiah stands before the throne and he hears the same thing by the same seraphim. Number two, Revelation 4, 11. 4, 11. <clears throat> Who's singing here? Well, let's read it. Verse nine, when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders also fall down and worship him who sits on the throne, will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying. So throughout Revelation, whenever the four living creatures sing, these 24 elders sing. Who are the 24 elders? Well, there's 12 from Israel, 12 sons of Jacob. There's 12 from Jesus' time, the 12 apostles. And you have 12 and 12 equals 24, which represents the church. The church. No Jew, not Gentile, one body in Christ. So these fall down, fall down in worship, cast their given crowns. They've been given crowns because they have white robes at God's feet. And they say this, verse 11, Worthy are you, O Lord, our Lord, our God, to receive glory, honor, power. For you created all things, and because your will they existed and were created. That's what they sing. They say. They chant. Whatever it is, it's worship to God. It's a doxology. Okay? It's Revelation 4, 8, 4, 11. Worthy are you. Now, number three, Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10. Turn over the page, or just that same page. This is the time when the, the book of the seven seals couldn't be opened and all that. But then he had uh, verse four, eight. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures, the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp. Now the only musical instruments in Revelation are two, the harp and the trumpet. That's it, no piano, no organ. No guitar, harp, and a trumpet. I don't know why, it's just something that came up in my studies. Golden bowls full of incense, which is the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. Now this song is different than the first two. The first two talk about Almighty God the Creator, Almighty God who lives forever and ever. But this introduces a new subject. They sang a new song, and the subject is redemption. Listen. Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, you men from every tribe, tongue, and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. The subject now is redemption. With your blood you purchased, with these blood you purchased and they will reign forever and ever with Christ. That's subject in Timothy. So that's number three. Number four is Revelation 5, 12. Now these first five are important. First five are important. These are all before the tribulation period. Look at 5, verse 12. Who's singing? I heard, I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures, the elders, all three now, four living creatures, 24 elders, and all the angels. And the number of them was myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice. So you have three groups of people. 
Why is that significant? Because of who's singing. And the next group is more significant. And what they say, again, it's before the awful tribulation. The rest of the songs in Revelation 7 and 11 are during and, and 19 after the tribulation. So here, here is the voice of the angels, all of them. Angels are never counted in the, in, the, in the Bible, never. People are counted. People are named and numbered. Angels are never, except a few angels, never counted, ever. Why is it important? Because what they say, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory. Worthy is the lamb. Now the subject is redemption. That's what we will sing in heaven. That's the subject of our songs in heaven. But notice the next one, number five, verse 13. Not only are the four living creatures, not only are the 24 elders who represent all of the church, not only are all the angels of heaven, now listen to this one. Every created thing, every created thing, anything that God made, can you think of anything that God made that isn't created? No, he created every living thing. Thing. And every created thing which is in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, and in the sea, everything joins in praise in this vast crescendo of praise saying, verse 13, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing, honor, glory, dominion forever and ever, ever and ever. That's our subject forever. Heaven will not be boring. We will be joined in singing to the praise to the Lamb. In heaven, on earth, under the earth, and the sea, summed up by saying, every creature, every creature, every creature, to him who sits on the throne, the doxology, the blessing, the honor, the glory, the dominion, forever and ever, we'll hear these songs sung throughout eternity, and you'll be there if you're a believer. The subject is redemption. They fall on their knees and worship. Now, just a disclaimer here. If you're not bowing to the knee now, you're not going to enjoy this because that's what we'll do in heaven. Everybody says they're going to heaven. Everybody's not going to heaven. It's not going to happen. The only way you can get heaven is if your name's in the book of life. And how do we know your name's in the book of life? By how you live, by how you act. People know. Now, Revelation 7.10 is the next one. Now, this is during the tribulation. This is during the awful time on the earth. This is during the grasshoppers, the drought, the rain, the floods, the murders of thousands and millions of people. This is what happens. During the tribulation period, during that seven year time, God will choose 12,000 Jewish evangelists from every tribe and they will go to the four corners of the earth to preach the gospel of the kingdom as told by Matthew. They are God's evangelists during the tribulation, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And as a result, people will believe. They'll come to faith in Christ in spite of the work of Satan who wants to destroy them and kills many of them. Many will be killed because of their faith in Christ. Verse nine, after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count these are people who've been killed for their faith in the tribulation time. From every nation, all tribes, people's tongues, standing before the throne, before the lamb, clothed in white robes. White robes means they've been cleansed and washed in the blood. Palm branches in their hands, they cry with a loud voice saying, and this is what these killed people say to God before the throne. Salvation to our God, death is salvation from the tyranny of the enemy. Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's what they sing. Every nation, tribe, people, tongue, standing before the throne in white robes in one accord, singing salvation. Note the words, salvation to our God. 
It's a theme, deliverance from evil. During that time, it'll be awful. It will be awful. If you think you have a second chance, it's not going to happen. If you can't believe God now by faith, you're not going to make it then either. Let's look at number seven, which is a continuation of this, this happening here. Verse 12. <clears throat> 11 and 12. And all the angels were standing around the throne. All the angels. How many are there? Myriads of myriads, thousands and thousands and millions and millions of angels around the throne. And the elders and the four living creatures. These, all these people who have been killed. They fell in their faces before the throne, worshiped God saying, verse 12, amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. That's the song we're gonna be singing. The angels, representative of the church, for cherubim, they all fell on their faces before God. Who are these? And it goes on to say, one of the elders, verse 13, said, who are these people? Where do they come from? These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They're redeemed people. And for this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night. So we don't serve God now, but we want to serve him in heaven. It's not going to happen. You serve him now, you serve him in heaven. And this is the time the temple will be built during the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. All right? <clears throat> they serve him. God protects them. The rest of the thing says they will hunger no longer, no thirst. God will protect them for the rest of the thousand years. Number eight, Revelation 11, verse 16. Sometime during the tribulation, I'm not sure when, during that awful, awful time, Jacob's trouble, it's called, people will be killed, people will be killed and, and they're sent to heaven and they'll bow before the throne and say, salvation to our God. Sometime during that time, this proclamation is made, verse 15. The seventh angel sounded, there will be loud voices in heaven. I don't know how loud, but very loud. And this is what the loud voice said. The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. That's the announcement. That's the loud word. That's the doxology that's pronounced at this point in the Revelation. So who's singing? The 24 elders sit on their thrones before God and fill in their faces. And they say, in another one, this is kind of a continuation here, number eight, number nine, um, there will be one kingdom, the kingdom of Satan will fall. The kingdom of Satan will fall. He's been trying to overthrow God's kingdom ever since. And only one will rule the earth, one. Number nine is 15, uh, 15, three and four. Let's take a look at that one. Number nine is 15, chapter 15, verses three and four. Who are these people singing? Tribulation saints again. Who's singing? Tribulation saints. <clears throat> saw another sign in heaven. In verse two, something beautiful. I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Brilliance. Those who had been victorious. Here's, here's who's singing. Those who had been victorious over the beast, the Antichrist, his image, his, his thing that he made for people to worship, and the number of his name. Those who did not bow to the cultural mandates those who did not buy the social system of the day, those who did not buy the deception of the devil, they were killed. They did not buy that, nor the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass. Now, other references in Ezekiel and Isaiah and Revelation, the sea of glass. Remember in Revelation 21, we talked about the streets of gold are crystal clear. That city is gonna be crystal clear. And that's what God's throne is. God's heavenly throne sits on a transparent, crystal clear platform. Harps, here's the harps played to God. And they say, and they sing a new song again. They sing a song of Moses, the song of the Lamb. And what's the song of Moses? The song of Moses, as you know, Exodus 15, when the people of Israel left Egypt and they went through the Dead Sea and they looked back and saw the Egyptians, the enemy, 
tyranny of Satan coming in after them. And they complained to Moses. Moses had just shut up and stand still and watch. So they turned around. As they looked, the waters came crashing on the Egyptians, destroyed every last one of them. Not one lived. And then they sang this song, Exodus 15. Well, what's the subject? Deliverance from the enemy. Deliverance from tyranny. That's the song of Moses. So in heaven, we're going to sing a song like that. And they, they sang it here. They sang the song of Moses, the bond servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, and this is what they said. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways. Now, why does he say that? Because as you look at the great tribulation, God does some awful nasty things to people. Nasty things. But here, righteous and true are your ways. What you do to these people who won't bow the knee, you're righteous in doing that. King of the nations, who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, and all the nations will come and worship before you. Listen to that. All the nations will come and worship before you. They don't worship him now. All the nations aren't coming to bow before Christ. It's going to happen soon. They sang the song of Moses and the Lamb, which is the subject is deliverance. Marvelous. All nations will come. All God's people from every nation as a result of the evangelist's work, the 144,000 will come. And they will worship God. Let's look at number 10, Revelation 16. Our songs will be of one main subject, God's redemption. Number 10 is Revelation 16, verse 5 and 6. This is during the tribulation. He's pouring out these cups of awful things happening. And the angel said in verse five, I heard the angel of the water saying, righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judged these things. God is perfect in what he's doing to people and causing the peoples in the earth. Righteous are you, for they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. And notice this phrase, they deserve it. That's the only thing people who don't believe God deserve, judgment, judgment. And then, um, that was number 10. And then these kind of are combined here. Number 11 is verse, verse seven. And then the altar said, now we don't know, the altar apparently had the personified voice and it said, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments, referring to the awful, awful, awful things that will happen to the earth during this time. True and righteous, it just simply states that God is good and what he's doing against those who hate him. That's the only thing humanity really deserves. Number 11 is 16, verse 7, and we just read that one. Heard the author saying, true and righteous are your judgments. It's just another affirmation to God for what he's doing, messing up the earth. Now, the next one, this is during the tribulation. The next one, Revelation 19, is after the tribulation. After the tribulation. Why is that important? Because it says, after these things. Now, this one is kind of long. It's connected together with the last two or three, 12, 13, and 14. They're all connected, but there's different sayings here. Let's read it all. 12. Number 12 is one to three, hallelujah. Who is singing? I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. I can imagine it's all the killed saints, the tribulation people who died because of their faith, the angels, the 24 elders, the four living creatures. And here's what they said, hallelujah. Hallelujah is two words, hallel, which means praise. J-A-H is God, praise God, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. And here's a quote. Because his judgments are true and righteous, he has messed up the earth majorly, but he's true and right for doing it. For he has judged the great harlot. Who's the harlot? She is the epitome of all evil. She is, she is one figure of all of Satan's empire. Because she takes away that which is not hers and takes it to herself, which is related to idolatry, and immorality. He has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth 
with her immorality. He has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, hallelujah, four times here. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. The small and the great, very significant statement. No matter who you are, no matter how much power you think you have or don't have, it's a small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of great multitude and the sound of many waters, like the sound of men, mighty peals of thunder. Very, very loud, like we heard thunder last night, but it was always in the distance. This is going to be much louder. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. It's always about God Almighty. It's always about the Lamb and that He will reign forever. So those are the last... 12, 13, and 14, loud thunder. 14 is the continuing from above. Let's rejoice and be glad, give glory to him. And then talks about the marriage of the Lamb. So these are the 14 different occasions of singing doxologies in heaven. Now, number five is every creature will praise him in 5 verse 13. In 15 verse 3 and 4, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb will be the main subject. Now I'd like for you to turn to three verses as we wrap it up here. Psalms 66, verse four. I want you to see something. It's not just a revelation, but peppered throughout the entire Bible. And this is the solution to our world's problem. It's not in social justice. It's not in better government. It's not in even better people. God has these, place, he, these people in place for his purposes. His purposes. Psalm 66, verse 4. I like to take comfort in these verses because this is God's word. His word is true and righteous. 66, verse 4. All the earth will worship you. All the earth. And we read Psalm 148, the opening. Everything will praise him. Fire and hail and storms and wind and trees. Every creature. All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name, Selah. That's important. They will sing praises to you. One day, the earth will worship you. Let's turn to another one, Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. This is what I'd like for you to be inspired with. Look for that new city. Look for singing the songs of praises to God. Isaiah 66, verse 23. One day, this will be a reality. One day, we'll see it. Your believer. Verse 23. Let's read 22 to 24. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath. All mankind will come to bow down before me. But you think you don't have to. Why is it that you don't think you have to? You will one day. All mankind will come to bow down before me. Verse uh, 23. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men. Here's what happens to those who don't pay him. Who have transgressed against me for their worm will not die, their fire will not be quenched, and there will be an abhorrence to all mankind. One day that'll be reality. And one more verse, Philippians chapter two, verse nine. If you know Philippians, it's a familiar verse. Philippians two, one day this will be a reality. One day this will be a reality. Philippians two, verses nine to 11. Not now, but then. Philippians two, verse nine. For this reason, God highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him, Jesus, the name which is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every knee, everyone of those who are in heaven, on the earth, under the earth. And every tongue will declare, confess that Jesus is Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day that will be a reality. Those in heaven, those on the earth, that every tongue will confess, worship, that Jesus is the Lord, the ruler, glory of God the Father. But there's a problem. The problem is Satan 
wants you to worship him. He wants you to bow to him. He wants you to sing to him. He wants you to worship him. He wants you to honor him, call him your Lord. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to accept him. He wants you to believe his promises. And one example is Matthew 4. Turn there with me. And this is our example of what happens and what when Satan comes to tempt you with earthly things. When Satan comes to tempt you with sin, with evil, this is what you do. This is God's word. This is true. Jesus was taken by the Spirit to be tempted. The tempter came. He tempted him three times. We'll look at the last one. And the devil took him on a very high mountain and notice this, showed him all the kingdoms of the world. The devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. I don't know how he did it, but it says it, I believe it. The world and their glory. Look at the beauty of what I have, Jesus. And he said to him, all these things I will give you. That means he owned them. He had them. He has the world in his hand. The whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one. He is the prince and power of the air. If you will fall down and worship me, and every day you get up, Satan wants you to worship him. That's his word to you. Because he said it to Jesus. He said it to Eve. And the whole world is cast into darkness. And what we need to do is what Jesus did right here. Go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Remember the verse in Revelation? All the kingdoms of the world and their glory belong to God. It's going to, but not yet. So how do you defeat the deceiver, the imitator? Everything Christ has set up in this world, Satan imitates. That's why in Revelation there's a false prophet beside the Antichrist who's helping to deceive you. You know the story about the frog. You throw a frog in boiling water, he'll jump out. But if you put a frog in cool water and turn on the heat, it is said, I've never done it. Have you? He'll boil to death. And that's what's happening to Christians today. We are being boiled to death by Satan's trickery. What we're to do is the same thing Jesus did. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the example I leave with you as I started is to live by faith as Abraham did. Abraham didn't have a book, a Bible to read that lays on your shelf unopened. He only had the spoken word of God and he believed and it was counted in for righteousness. You and I have this book and we can read it in our language. One day, Satan will bow to God Almighty. One day, Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. As it says in Revelation 20, verse 10, Satan, the devil, the antichrist, one who imitates Christ and the false prophet, the one who goes around telling, and we have false prophets today, they're false preachers. They tell stuff that isn't true. But one day there'll be three people, the, the, the satanic trinity, just as your father, son, and Holy spirit, there's a satanic one, the, the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophets. They will be thrown, cast, not just, here's your door, folks, please enter. They'll be thrown with some kind of violence into the lake of fire and tormented forever and ever. And you want to serve him? Please don't. Please bow the knee now to Christ Jesus because you will bow to him one day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, awful words, but true. Your words are true and righteous. Lord, as we take a few moments now to remember your broken body, your broken body, your shed blood, and that is the only way we enter heaven is by believing it, receiving it, accepting it, and serving you, following you, taking up the cross, 
and following you. The instrument of death. The instrument of death. Lord, help us to believe it. So bless this time where we take the bread, we take the cup, and remember he who died in our place. In Christ's name. All right.